Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case uh, world in Romanian and I will also be doing my makeup at the same time and this case was actually suggested by the wandering dog one of my YouTube viewers now this guy I have to say that is all sorts of effed up okay he is just effed up you've probably heard of him and you know I very rarely cover serial killers but I think that Thinking about it, I should probably do it more often. So anyway, the word for today in Romanian is Iosif. 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 Well done, guys. You just said Joseph. So today was actually a name day. Anyway, just to move on with the video, today we are talking about Joseph Edward Duncan III. So, you know what, I'll just refer to him as Duncan, so we don't get him confused, because his father's name was also Joseph. Joseph Edward Duncan III was born in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, on February 25th, 1963. He was actually the fourth of five children born to Joseph Edward Duncan Jr. and Lillian May Duncan. He had three older sisters and a younger brother. Duncan's father was in the United States Army and because of this, the family actually moved quite a lot. They moved from city to city, both within the US and also abroad, changing locations every year or every two years until the elder Duncan retired to Tacoma, Washington, when the younger Duncan was around 12 years old. Duncan's mother was described as a domineering woman, and I am talking about uh, the young Duncan. So she was described as a domineering woman, but although he claimed after being arrested in 1980 to have been abused as a child, his younger brother disputed this, his parents ended up separating in 1979 and they would divorce in 1983. His sisters soon left the household all at once and Duncan remained behind with his mother while his brother went to live with their father after some time. His father would later remarry, giving Duncan a step family. Duncan attended Lakes High School, but he didn't actually graduate. And you know what, Duncan actually had a long history as a violent sexual predator. He committed his first recorded sex crime in 1978 when he was only 15 years old. In that incident, he raped a 9-year-old boy at gunpoint. The following year, he was arrested for driving a stolen car. He tried to outrun police in the stolen car at one point even trying to run down a police officer. Trying to outrun the police roadblock, he actually had a car crash which shattered his sinuses and the right side of his face. He was sentenced as a juvenile and he was sent to the Jesse Dysling Boys Ranch in Tacoma for several months. During assessments at Western State Hospital near Tacoma, Duncan detailed a history, a sexual history that began at age 8 when he was allegedly performing incestuous acts with female relatives. By 12 years old he told doctors that he forced a 5 year old boy to perform oral sex on him. At 15 years old Duncan told the doctors that he did the same thing to a 9 year old boy at gunpoint at that time. The hospital report noted that Duncan would go out specifically looking for victims. By age 16, he told doctors that he committed 13 rapes of young boys. In one case, he claimed that he tied up six boys ages 6 through 10 years old, forced them to perform oral sex, then raped them anally. Clinical director Dr. William Voorhees Jr. and other officials wrote in their report, quote, This position of power over children has developed into a very powerful and compulsive pattern. Mr. Duncan is not safe to be at large. End of quote. In 1980, Duncan stole a few guns from a neighbor and abducted a 14-year-old boy, raping him at gunpoint again. 
Just before his 17th birthday, he was arrested for the breaking and stealing guns, then attacking the 14-year-old boy and then raping him. That incident appears to have been the first time that Duncan was charged with a sex crime. He carried out this burglary in the evening knowing that the neighbor would be gone, so he smashed out a storm window and broke into the bedroom. He stole four pistols, about 1,000 rounds of ammunition and some pornographic magazines. He said later that his plan was to return home, look at the magazines and masturbate. But he later wrote in a court questionnaire, then I decided why not the real thing, so I got a gun and went cruising for a victim. He found the 14-year-old boy in front of a nearby school. He forced the boy into the woods and made the boy strip, then made him perform oral sex on him twice, hit him repeatedly with a stick, burned his buttocks with a cigarette and then let him go. When Duncan got home, the police were waiting for him. He pled guilty to first degree rape. He later said that the rape stemmed from a sense of rejection by his mother and father as well. He said that he was upset because his parents had, had been fighting a lot and they were breaking up because he was also upset because he was doing uh, not so well in school, quite badly actually, and because he couldn't get into the Air Force with his auto theft conviction. Well, probably you should have thought of that earlier, right? He was sentenced to a maximum of 20 years in prison, but the time was suspended, so Duncan was committed to sex offender treatment at Western State Hospital. A psychological evaluation at the hospital found that Duncan, only 17 years old at the time, was preoccupied with deviant sexual fantasies and meets the definition of the sexual psychopath. By 1982, Western State Hospital just gave up. Duncan was 19 years old at the time. His therapist said that after 22 months of treatment in the program, Duncan showed an unwillingness to change his sexually, his sexually deviant behaviors and chose not to commit himself to program techniques. He showed a constant need to maintain secrecy about his fantasies and rebelled against treatment. Quote, after 22 months in, in the program, Mr. Duncan has shown an unwillingness to modify his sexually deviant behaviors and has chosen not to commit himself to program techniques. This is what the therapist wrote about him. Duncan showed a constant need to maintain secrecy about his fantasies and rebelled against treatment. And I don't know why I feel like I'm repeating exactly what I said in quote in quotation marks and if I did I do apologize they also mentioned something in particular that happened with Duncan so on Valentine's Day 1982 Duncan's mother came to stay with him at the Western State Hospital cottage which was used for family visits after his mother went to bed Duncan gathered up his coat gloves and an extension cord he jumped the hospital wall and sneaked up to a nearby house where he spied on an 18-year-old girl and people in other houses. When the dogs began barking and the man spotted him, Duncan fled back to the cottage where he woke up his mother. She then taught him how to disco dance. I mean, really? I was just laughing when I read this one because he's just out there spying on people, on young girls. A man finds him, so he runs back and his mother is teaching him how to dance? A week later, Duncan said that he wanted to leave treatment and serve his time in prison. So therapists then wrote to Pierce County officials that Duncan exhibited little remorse or guilt for his sexual deviation while in treatment and he wasn't safe to be at large. Therapists said that he's available for transport back to the county by the sheriff as soon as possible. The therapist wrote to uh, Pierce County officials that he exhibited little remorse or guilt for his sexual deviation while in treatment and he wasn't safe to be at large. And again, I feel like I'm repeating. What's going on? I'm so sorry guys. I know that I've uh, reviewed this script before I recorded the video and I'm not sure what happened. I think that, you know, sometimes I keep uh, reviewing and reading and rereading the script um, over and over again just to make sure that I have everything right. 
and uh, probably because I keep reading the same thing over and over again I, I just don't realize when I'm repeating stuff in 1982 he was sentenced to at least three and no more than 20 years in prison Duncan served 14 years for the rape of that boy and three more for parole violations he was released on parole in 1994 after serving 14 years whilst he was out on parole he lived in several places in the Seattle area. He was arrested again in 1996 for marijuana use and then he was released on parole a few weeks later with new restrictions. Authorities believe that Duncan murdered Sammy Joe White and Carmen Cabias in Seattle in 1996 and Anthony Martinez in Riverside County, California in 1997 but uh, both of those cases went cold and they weren't actually linked to him until after he was arrested in a future case. Duncan was again arrested in Missouri and he was returned to prison in 1997 after he violated the terms of his parole. He was then released from prison on 14th of July 2000 with time off for good behavior. That's when he moved to Fargo, North Dakota. In March 2005, Duncan was charged with the July the 3rd, 2004 molestation of two boys at a playground in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. On April the 5th, 2005, he appeared before a Becker County judge who set the bail at $15,000. A businessman from Fargo who knew Duncan helped him to post bail. But Duncan actually skipped bail and he completely vanished. So on June the 1st, a federal warrant was issued for his arrest on the charge of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. On May 16, 2005, authorities discovered the bodies of 40-year-old Brenda Grown, her boyfriend, 37-year-old Mark McKenzie, and her son, 13-year-old Slade Groin, in their home along Lake Kerdalen, outside the city of Kerdalen, Idaho. Two of Brenda's other children, 9-year-old Dylan and 8-year-old Shasta, were missing. So an Amber Alert was issued and the area was searched for the missing children whilst authorities were investigating the deaths at the home as homicides. The autopsies determined that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. The victims had also been bound. Seven weeks later, in the early morning of July the 2nd, 2005, Shasta, the eight-year-old daughter, was seen at a Denny's restaurant in Kerdalen in the company of an unknown man. A waitress, manager and two customers at the restaurant actually recognized her from media reports. So they kind of placed themselves around to prevent the man from leaving with a girl. Police arrived and they arrested the man, later identifying him as Duncan. He was arrested without incident. Oh, I was supposed to be using the other foundation. Shasta told the waitress and police who she was and she was taken to Kutni Medical Center for medical treatment and also to be reunited with her father, Steve Groin. Remember that, you know, she was in the house with her mom, siblings, and also her mom's boyfriend. Her dad didn't live in the same house as her parents were separated. Kurt Dalen, police detained Duncan on kidnapping charges and on his outstanding federal warrant. When Shasta was found without her brother, nine-year-old Dylan, police had very little hope that he will be found alive. They asked the public for tips specifically if they have seen the stolen red Jeep Cherokee or Cherokee with Missouri license plates that Duncan was driving at the time of his arrest. Police found out that Duncan rented the car in Minnesota and never returned it. A gas station employee in Kellogg, Idaho, around 40 miles or 64 kilometers east of Kerdalen, recognized the Jeep as one which had stopped at her station just hours before Duncan was arrested. The employee suspected that the girl wandering around the station might have been Shasta but didn't actually approach her as nothing appeared out of the ordinary. 
The employee and her manager notified authorities after they reviewed surveillance camera footage and identified Duncan and Shasta in the video. On July the 4th, 2005, investigators found human remains at a remote makeshift campsite in the Lolo National Forest near St. Regis, Montana. The remains were sent to the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia for DNA testing and they were positively identified as those of nine-year-old Dylan, Shasta's brother. During the trial, it actually came to light that Duncan shot Dylan at point-black range by holding a sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun to his head. Most of what we know about the murders of the Groin family came from Shasta Groin. According to her police interview, Duncan killed her mother, older brother and her mother's fiancé and then kidnapped her and her brother, driving away with them in the stolen Jeep Cherokee. Shasta said that her mother came into Dylan's and her room and woke them up saying that someone was in the house and they went into the living room where she saw Duncan wearing black gloves and holding a gun. He tied her mother's hand with nylon zip ties and did the same to her mother's fiancé and her brother's slave. Shasta and Dylan were taken from the house and they were then placed outside on the lawn. While she waited with her brother, Shasta heard multiple thumping sounds coming from inside the home. She then saw her injured older brother staggering away from the entrance to the home. Duncan then bludgeoned them to death and took Shasta and Dylan to his car. Both of them were taken to other locations where they were repeatedly molested and tortured for six weeks. Shasta stated that they drove a long distance and stayed in two different campsites where Duncan told her that he beat her family members to death with a hammer. Shasta also told investigators how Dylan, her brother, was murdered. Duncan insisted though that his death was an accident. Shasta was standing on the other side of Duncan's Jeep when she heard a loud boom. She ran to the other side of the Jeep and she saw Dylan lying on the ground screaming. Duncan was apparently going through a clear plastic box looking for beer when a shotgun that was also in the box went off hitting Dylan in the stomach. Shasta said that she then saw Duncan put the shotgun to Dylan's head and pull the trigger but the gun didn't fire. Dylan at that point begged Duncan not to kill him but Duncan reloaded the shotgun, got it, got it back to Dylan's head and pulled the trigger. Dylan was killed instantly. According to Shasta, Duncan then started crying and told her that he only killed him to put him out of his misery. A public memorial service was held for Dylan on July 16, 2005, which would have been his 10th birthday, birthday at Real Life Ministries. Shasta reported that Duncan almost killed her as well a few days after killing Duncan. She said that he gave her the choice to be killed either by strangulation or with a gun. Shasta actually chose the strangulation and Duncan wrapped a rope around her neck and pulled on it causing Shasta to start suffocating. But she was able to catch enough breath to actually beg him to stop using his nickname Jet and he finally and he immediately stopped. He then asked Shasta if she would like to meet his mother and she agreed, so the two of them drove back towards Coeur d'Alene and stopped at the Denny's restaurant where Shasta was eventually rescued. Duncan's arrest led the FBI to launch a nationwide review of unsolved missing child cases. He was implicated as a suspect in several crimes that happened between 1994 and 1997 when he was on parole and between 2000 and 2005 when he was out of prison. Even though he was cleared as a suspect in a few cases, authorities in California and Washington had enough evidence to believe that Duncan committed unsolved murders in their jurisdictions. On April the 4th, 1997, 10-year-old Anthony Michael Martinez was playing with his friends in the front yard of his home in Beaumont, California, when an unknown man approached the group to ask for help in finding a missing cat. When the boys refused to help, this man grabbed Anthony at knife point and then threw him in the car. 
he was taken in front of his younger brother and cousin, whom Anthony had been fighting to protect. After a long interview with the boys who saw what happened, a sketch of the man was created, which was released to the media. Many tips were called in as a result, but sadly, none of them brought anything new to the investigation. After a two-week search for Anthony, his body was found naked and partially decomposed in Indio, California, on April 19. He had been sexually assaulted and bound with duct tape. A composite sketch of the suspect was made available and a partial fingerprint was taken from the duct tape found on Anthony's body, but the case eventually went cold. In July 2005, bloggers noticed quite a few similarities between Duncan and the composite sketch in the Anthony Martinez case, as well as between Duncan's car and the one Anthony's attacker was driving. The FBI and National Center for Missing and Exploited Children got involved and they in turn contacted Riverside County authorities. I assume that, you know, the bloggers, when they made this connection, they contacted the authorities. Riverside authorities were able to match the fingerprint taken from Anthony's body to Duncan and on August the 3rd, the Riverside County Sheriff's Department officially announced Duncan's connection with the Anthony Martinez case. FBI agents reported that Duncan confessed to the murder in an interview on July 19, 2005, describing the crime as revenge against society, again for sending him back to jail for a probation violation. After she was rescued, Shasta told investigators that Duncan told her about some other crimes he committed, including the Anthony Martinez murder and the 1996 murders of Sammy Joe White, who was aged 11, and her half-sister Carmen Kubias, who was 9 years old. They both vanished on July the 6th, 1996, after leaving the Crest Motel in Seattle to get cigarettes at a nearby restaurant for an older brother. Police said they didn't know if the girls ran away or were victims of foul play. The remains of Sammy Joe and Carmen were found on February 10th, 1998 by a transient living in an abandoned barn near Northeast 195th Street and 120th Avenue Northeast in the North Creek area of Bothell. The King County Medical Examiner's Office said that the girls were probably killed very soon after they disappeared. Duncan actually confessed to beating the two young girls to death. Duncan had been convicted in three courts in Idaho District Court for the kidnapping and the murders of Brenda and Slade Groin and Mark McKenzie, the United States District Court for the District of Idaho for the kidnapping of Shasta and Dylan Groin, the murder of Dylan Groin and other crimes, and the California Superior Court for the kidnapping and murder of Anthony Martinez. Duncan first appeared in a Kootenai County Court on July 13, 2005, where he was charged with three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of first-degree kidnapping, all in conjunction with the deaths of Brenda and Slade Groin and Mark McKenzie. County prosecutors initially planned to charge him with the kidnappings of Shasta and Dylan, but they deferred those charges to the federal courts as transporting children across state lines for the purpose of sexual exploitation is a federal offense. The trial was set to begin on 17th of January 2006, but it was delayed until April the 4th after the district judge granted the request to the defense for more time to prepare for the trial and then again to October 26 after the judge in the case stated that no one wants to try this case twice including me. Duncan's attorneys blamed the multiple delays on the prosecution's insistence on pursuing the death penalty. On October 16, 2006, shortly after jury selection began, Kootenai County prosecutors and Duncan's attorney reached a plea bargain in which Duncan pleaded guilty to all state charges against him. He was sentenced to three consecutive parole sentences without the possibility of parole, life sentences without the possibility of parole for the three kidnapping charges. 
Sentencing on the three murder charges was continued pending the outcome of his federal trial on kidnapping and murder charges. The judge said that if he didn't receive the death penalty on the federal charges, he would return to Kootenai County for a death penalty phase on the state murder charges. Two years later, after being sentenced to death on federal charges, Kootenai County sentenced Duncan to three additional life sentences. Duncan also agreed to cooperate uh, with Kootenai County Sheriff's detectives investigating his crimes and provide passwords to encrypted files stored on his computer. Duncan at one point had studied at university as a computer technician or something like that, so you know he was quite good with technology. On January 18, 2007, Duncan was indicted by a federal grand jury in Kerdalen on 10 counts of kidnapping, kidnapping resulting in death, aggravated sexual abuse of a minor, and sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death, and other crimes related to illegal firearm possession and vehicle theft. He was arraigned the following day at the federal court in Boise, where a judge ordered Duncan to stand trial the following March. Duncan's defense attorneys requested a postponement, which was granted the week the trial was originally scheduled to begin, so a new trial date was set for January 22nd, 2008. On December the 3rd, 2007, Duncan pleaded guilty to all 10 charges against him. As a condition of the agreement, Shasta Groin would not have to testify in the penalty phase of the trial. Due to a gag order, other details of the plea agreement were not released. Jury selection for the penalty phase for Duncan's federal trial began on April 14, 2008. During jury selection, Duncan dismissed his attorneys and chose to represent himself. His attorneys objected, saying that he wasn't really competent to do so and they actually requested a formal hearing. The district court actually then ordered an evaluation of Duncan to determine if he was competent and accepted the evaluator's decision, conclusion that he was competent to proceed without counsel. On August 27, 2008, after three hours of deliberation, the jury recommended the death penalty, and the judge imposed three death sentences for kidnapping resulting in death, sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death, and also use of a firearm in a violent crime resulting in death. These were all related to the death of Dylan Groin. On November the 3rd, 2008, Duncan was sentenced to an additional three consecutive terms of life without parole in federal prison for kidnapping Shasta Groin and for sexually abusing Shasta and Dylan. Duncan's standby counsel filed a notice of appeal. Duncan wrote to the court and informed the court that any appeal was taken against his wishes. In July 2011, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the district court's decision to allow Duncan to represent himself without first holding a hearing. Beginning in September 2012, Duncan was held at the United States Penitentiary, Penitentiary Terre Haute in Indiana. On December the 6, 2013, a federal judge ruled that he was mentally competent when he gave up the right to appeal his death sentence. Psychiatrists working with the prosecution actually diagnosed Duncan with pedophilia, sadistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder with narcissistic traits but maintained that he was legally sane. A three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals ruled on March 27, 2015 that a district judge correctly determined that Duncan was mentally competent when he waived his right to appeal his death sentence. On February 28, 2016, the United States Supreme Court denied Duncan's petition to hear his appeal of a federal judge's ruling in December 2013, which was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit. On February 28, 2017, a petition for writ of habeas corpus was filed. This is basically used to bring a prisoner before the court to determine if the imprisonment is lawful. On September 27, 2017, it was ordered that the government's third motion for extension of time was granted in part and denied in part. The government's response was due on October 30, 2017. 
on January 18, 2007, the same day that Duncan was indicted in federal court, Riverside County officials announced that he was charged with Anthony Martinez's murder. Despite attempts by Riverside County officials to extradite Duncan to California, including an appeal by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Duncan's federal trial proceeded. He was eventually extradited to California on January 24, 2009, five months after being sentenced to death by the federal court. It's very complicated, especially this uh, trial, or the trials, should I say. On March 15, 2011, Duncan pleaded guilty to Anthony Martinez's murder and was sentenced to two life terms on April 5, 2011. As part of a plea deal, the sentence came without the possibility of parole or the right to appeal. Although Duncan could have faced a separate death, death sentence... Oh, this whole time I forgot to turn the light on. Never mind. In addition to the ones he had already been sentenced to in federal court, Riverside County District Attorney Paul Zellerbach justified the life sentence by stating that he consulted with the Martinez family who wanted closure in the case. Before his arrest for murder, Duncan had a personal website called The Fifth Nail. According to tradition, I guess, or maybe belief, in addition to the four nails used to pierce the body of Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, there was a fifth nail that was taken away and hidden by the Romans. Duncan chose the name for his own website and blog. On the website, which depicted his day-to-day -day life as a convicted sex offender, he denied being a pedophile and claimed to have been sexually abused as a child. After going to prison, Duncan still maintained a blogspot website called Joseph E. Duncan III returns to the web from federal death row to expose the meaning of the fifth nail. All the content on the blog was posted by someone called Silenced, who presumably received letters from Duncan to post on the blog on his behalf. John Adams, Duncan's public defender in Kootenai County, and prosecutor Bill Douglas declined to comment on the possibility that maybe Duncan was actually the one blogging from prison. Inmates don't have access to the internet and whilst outgoing letters are scanned for requests for contraband or for help in planning an escape, they are not actually read word by word. The jurors who imposed the death penalty on Duncan were actually offered counseling so they could cope with the horrific evidence that they had to see during the trial. Among the evidence shown in court was a 33-minute video depicting Duncan naked, torturing physically and verbally assaulting and sexually abusing a naked and restrained boy identified as 9-year-old Dylan Groin. The video showed this abuse taking place in various areas inside of what appeared to be a rundown single level wooden shed or small cabin. Other evidence included human remains, a wire noose and other videos of Duncan's continued torture of Dylan. During one of these videos a child was heard screaming in pain whilst Duncan still naked shouted The devil is here boy, the devil himself, the devil likes to watch children suffer and cry. Cherry Cox, or Sherry Cox, I do apologize if I'm not pronouncing this right, one of Duncan's sisters actually testified in court during his competency hearing. She testified about what it was like growing up with Duncan in, in their childhood home. She said that she and her four siblings were frequently beaten by their mother, while the mother kept saying that men were worthless. Sherry described her mother as a crazy woman who attended church obsessively every day. Duncan, who was the second youngest of the five children, was passive in the face of the beatings. If their mother would beat them up and they would fight back, the beating only got worse. So Duncan would just take whatever beating she gave him and would just end up crying in his bedroom. Their father, who was in the military and often deployed, was frequently the target of their mother's mockery. Cherry said that she left home when she was 17 years old and she only saw Duncan once after that, a few years later, when he was a patient at the Washington State Psychiatric Hospital. Years later, her sister called to see if she'd heard or seen Duncan because no one talked to him in quite some time. Cherry told her sister she didn't hear from him. About a week later, when she was boating, 
She actually heard Duncan's name during a radio news story. That's when she found out that he had been arrested for what he did in Idaho. So what we are hearing is that, okay, Duncan didn't have it great, right? He was abused and so on, but you know, so were his siblings and they didn't do what he did. So that's not an excuse really. However, Bruce Duncan, who spoke with Kurt Allen Press, Duncan's brother said that they were normal children of an army family while growing up. They moved every year or every two years. They traveled quite a bit until their father retired in Tacoma. They went to school, to church. They were members of the Boy Scouts. They were just typical teenagers. After his parents divorced, when he was 16 years old, Duncan was convicted for raping a 14-year-old boy at gunpoint and sent to prison. He actually told prison therapists that he suffered incest and other abuse at home and he molested numerous children before he was caught. But Bruce Duncan disputes this, saying that the stories were just fabrications. They grew up in the same household. Bruce was never abused and he never saw any kind of abuse happening. He also said that all of the allegations from the childhood, 99% of them were false. Bruce said that he saw his brother a few times in prison. When he got out, they met in Seattle at his apartment and they hung out a few times, seeing each other on holidays. Bruce believes that the nearly two decades his brother spent in prison changed him. He was a teenager when he went in. He was confused about his sexuality and he was thrown in prison with murderers and rapists, becoming the target of other prisoners looking for sex. Bruce Duncan said he didn't pay much attention to the killings or the urgent requests for any information seeking the return of the two growing children. He didn't even know that his brother was on the run because he didn't tell anyone in the family about the charges on the playground with the boys, for example, where he molested the two boys. But his arrest made his family targets. Bruce changed his phone number twice and Duncan's arrest actually split the family. Some of them are in denial, others are angry, and others just want to ignore what happened. Bruce said that only he and their mother Lillian have been in contact with him since his arrest. Bruce would have loved to sit down and talk to Duncan without the FBI listening in because, she wa because he was sure that Duncan would tell him more than he would anyone else. Of course, that Bruce said that anything he would find out, he would give the information to authorities. He also said that Duncan wanted to get caught when he took Shasta to the restaurant. He knew what would happen. He knew that he's going to be arrested. In 2016, Shasta Groin, who was then 19 years old, started a petition called Slade and Dylan's Law in honor of her two brothers. In the petition description, she stated that convicted sex offenders shouldn't be freed out of jail. This would mean that the three-strike rule for violent sex offenders would need to be reduced to one strike. By the time the petition closed, it had 51,820 supporters. Duncan was imprisoned on federal death row at the United States Penitentiary in, Ter in Terre Haute, Indiana. Through his blog spot, he gave updates on his life from prison and described what life was like on federal death row. According to him, he barely interacted with other death row prisoners and he chose not to speak with them or engage in any conversation, claiming he didn't really socialize with anyone at all. He would only speak to other prisoners when he really had to do it. He also claimed that he never received any trouble from other inmates and he was only harassed a few times by prison guards. In July 2019, the United States federal government announced that they would be resuming executions after almost a two decade break. Duncan said that he was relieved to hear this as it was his opinion that being executed by lethal injection would be a better and cleaner way to die rather than dying of natural causes in prison, which is what he feared the most. He claimed that he was worried that the government would never get around to executing him. The five other prisoners selected to be executed with him were Lesmond Mitchell, Wesley Perky, Daniel Lee, Alfred Bourgeois and Dustin Honken. Duncan said that he was acquainted with four of them but wouldn't really call any of them his friends. He also said that everyone on federal death row would be better off if they were executed. In my honest opinion, I feel like perhaps, uh, the, it, perhaps uh, the punishment would be bigger if they would uh, end up spending the rest of their life in prison. 
because like like Duncan just said, he prefers the death row because he doesn't get to die of natural causes, as in, you know, growing old and dying in prison. In October 2020, Duncan was diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is brain cancer, for which he underwent brain surgery. He refused any treatment and he refused chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Medical staff at the Federal Bureau of Prisons estimated that he had between 6 and 12 months left to live. He died on 28th of March 2021 at the age of 58 and his body was cremated. Shasta Groin was only 8 years old when she spotted someone hiding in her bedroom closet on May 15, 2005. Her 9-year-old brother Dylan actually comforted her and then she fell back asleep but she was later woken up by her mother, who tearfully told her that someone was in the house. Shasta went into the living room where she found her father and older brother face down with their mouths duct taped. A man with night vision goggles and a shotgun was standing above them. Shasta and her nine-year-old brother Dylan were tied up by Duncan, who then took them outside to his car. After killing her entire family, Duncan physically and sexually abused both of the children until Duncan killed her brother Dylan in front of her. After this, Shasta said that there was something inside of her pushing her to do or say things just to get on Duncan's good side and to earn his trust. Before her brother Dylan was murdered, she told him that she was going to get both of them out of there, but sadly she just couldn't. After she managed to survive, Shasta was doing everything to stay alive, so she began to talk about herself with Duncan, telling him details like how much she loved school and how much she missed it. That made Duncan feel good, believing that she trusts him. She was only trying to manipulate him, but he felt that he was learning about her life and her vulnerabilities. Then, Duncan eventually decided to take the two of them to Denny's so they could get a milkshake or something. But the day before, Duncan told her that he wanted her to meet his mom and his family in North Dakota. He wanted to take her there. So they arrive at the restaurant and there is this man there. He makes eye contact with Shasta, he looks at her and she notices him and nods her head. The man nods back. She could tell that this man knew exactly who she was. At this point, Shasta had been missing for seven weeks. So this man went to the waitress, who then called the police. After a police officer arrived, he actually questioned Shasta, but she lied at first, telling the officer that her name was Katie. But weirdly, Duncan told her to just tell the police officer who she was, that it was okay. That's when she told the officer that she is Shasta. As soon as she said that, the officer grabbed Duncan and handcuffed him. Shasta actually found it really difficult to return to a safe place. She was struggling with survivor's guilt. She promised her brother Dylan that she would make sure they both got out alive. So she carried all of this guilt because he didn't survive, but she did. It should have been the other way around, she said. After years of struggling with substance abuse and disordered eating, Shasta is still recovering from her trauma but she finally felt strong enough to tell her story. She is now married, she has four children, and she works as a supervising housekeeper at a hotel. Now, this was, it really was a handful, wasn't it? And it was so confusing with all of these trials happening in all of these different states. But, oh God, this man, I have to say, this man, he was just despicable, really. To do what he did... To record himself, I can't even begin to imagine how everyone in that courtroom felt when they saw the videos and they heard the screams. I'm just happy for Shasta that she survived and she's doing so much better now. And I'm also glad that Duncan was convicted and died as well because I believe that he would have carried on killing. He really needed to be stopped. And too bad that he wasn't done sooner and he wasn't stopped sooner. He went on for a very long time and, you know, he kept on getting either, uh, you know, with the sentence suspended or on probation or uh, getting out early on good behavior. He was given opportunities over and over again to carry on doing what he did. And uh, sadly, a lot of people ended up losing their lives because of it. I don't know. It's so, it's tragic really, it really is. But anyway, thank you guys so much for staying with me today. Please do let me know what do you think in the comment section under this video. For now, stay safe.
Take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!